All right. Well, happy Friday out there. Uh, welcome to another Fireside Friday chat here, um, brought to you by the Entrepreneurship uh, Entrepreneurial Center uh, at Ohio Wesleyan University of the Delaware Entrepreneurial Center, as we call it, the Deck Owu. Um, so we appreciate you joining us and uh, um, take a couple minutes and uh, tune in with us and uh, chat live. So today we are chatting with Kevin Gad. So uh, we'll uh, get to know Kevin here for those that don't. And uh, yeah, let's dive in. All right, well, welcome. Thanks. For All right, so well, welcome, uh, Kevin. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, for tuning in and joining us today. Yeah, that was cool. I wasn't sure what was going to happen there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually sitting by a fireplace. I don't know if you can see it, but there's no fire in it. So it's nice. Like a fire, nice. Fireplace side chat. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so, well, yeah, we usually like to well, start yeah, this out for, with. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. No, no. Thanks for, for, for coming. Um, usually like to start this out with a, like an origin story um, just to kind of give perspective. So uh, obviously, I, you know, I know you well and uh been around the entrepreneurial scene, you know, from being an entrepreneur, uh, building, scaling companies, mentoring companies, um, teaching entrepreneurship, but um, give a little perspective, you know, what uh, what you've done in the, the business realm and the, the origin story of where you're at today. Sure. You know, whenever I do these things, it makes me feel really old, uh, Steve. <laughs> when I start to think about uh, all the cool stuff I've been able to do, um, so really, uh, I came back to Columbus. Uh, I got out of active duty Air Force. I was in comm tech while I was in the Air Force, and I worked on the newest stuff uh, when I first got in, uh, brand new mainframe computers in 85. And I worked on the oldest stuff when I got out, so uh, five-hole paper tape, reading that and typing up email, basically, before we ever had email, and printing those out on five-hole paper tape and then running them through a machine to send it from base to base. Um, I got out, came back here in 91, uh, joined uh, the Air National Guard unit, South City at, at uh, Rickenbacker, and then I, I went to Ohio State. So I went to work, work full-time, went to school full-time at Ohio State. Um, and then when I got, after I graduated in 94, um, you know, I tried to get a tech job. I wanted to find a tech job, and it was uh, kind of hard to do if you didn't really... You know, it was really in the early stages, 94, if you could think back then. Uh, luckily, I was able to fool some people at White Castle corporate headquarters into giving me a job as an IT support specialist. And, uh, you know, I had been doing a lot of stuff on my own, tearing apart computers and just really curious kind of guy. Uh, and that's how I got the job. Spent a couple of years there. Went to the limited one of the divisions of the limited uh, spent about a year or so there. And then me and a couple of buddies decided we're paying consultants to do this stuff that we can do. Why don't we just quit and start our own consulting company? Uh, so this was 90, you know, like 96, 97. Uh, so three of us left, started our own consulting company, the Prometheus group back then. And we did cool, crazy things like set up people's email servers and proxy servers and uh, explain what they would do if they got an internet connection in their office, which is, you know, kind of funny if you think about it now. Um, ran, uh, worked that for a couple of years, and then we were acquired by a company locally called Digital Storage, uh, which was owned by Rich Langdale uh, at the time. And uh, we became the tech component uh, of it, and then we put some operations folks with it and started a company called Submit Order at that time. So that would have been around 99, 98, 99. Submit Order, if you know that story, we raised about $340 million, you know, for the, for the longest time. It was the most money raised in Ohio. It was a, a third-party logistics company uh, when companies were, you know, rushing to get on the internet and e-commerce. They didn't think about how you're going to get the product to somebody. So we handled... Uh, distribution, customer service for a bunch of big brands when they first got on the internet back in the, you know, the early 2000s, late 90s. Um, from there, went on to start a couple other things, mostly IT outsourcing companies um, with, with some friends. 
Um, then I, I um, chance to be the technology commercialization director at Tech Columbus, so what's now uh, Rev One, and that really got me way more into the startup, uh, you know, uh, environment here in Central Ohio. It was the time when we, the state, had just given us a ton, of money, and so we were very popular. <laughs> so we talked to a lot of startups, a lot of helped a lot of startups raise money, move forward. You know, mentoring them, coaching them, helping them raise money. That was a pretty cool gig. Uh, I left there, raised some money from NCT Ventures, and started a company called Venture Highway. And really, the idea there was that entrepreneurship education was bad. Uh, was bad, and it was growing. So we, you know, we had stats from the Kauffman Foundation that more and more colleges and universities were building entrepreneurship programs, but. They, they were building them like English programs, big right. thick textbooks and reading books and writing how you would have done it. That's not the way to do it. And so our vision was get things online, get people hands on, allow them to interact when they're doing their business plans or business model canvases. Um, you know, it was a great idea, I thought. And, you know, we grew it for a little while, never could get it sold was the challenge. Uh, the, the folks we were trying to woo into buying us really wanted to build rather than buy. So we did sell it, but not for really anything. And uh, in that run, I got to do some cool stuff like uh, teach entrepreneurship at Ohio State, teach entrepreneurship at um, Columbus College of Art and Design, help Franklin University start their entrepreneurship program. And then I got an opportunity to go overseas and uh, teach on help build an entrepreneurship college uh, and center in uh, in Saudi Arabia, just north of Jeddah, and then uh, taught for about a year and a half at a private women's college in Saudi Arabia, teaching entrepreneurship at the time when women were just getting starting to get freedoms over there. So, uh, you know, probably, you know, of all that, that, that was one of the highlights of my career, just working with those young women and seeing them, you know, realize they could start a business or they could dream. Um, that was pretty darn cool. And I still have a lot of good relationships from that. Since then, uh, I, I joined a nonprofit. You know, at that, I was kind of looking for a nonprofit. I wanted to do something with veterans predominantly because I'm a retired Air Force chief. And um, I was approached to be the state director for a nonprofit called Apprenti. And that's what I do now. And uh, our mission is to help folks uh, get into tech careers through registered apprenticeship. Uh, our primary demographic targets are women, people of color, and veterans, folks that are having trouble getting, making that leap like I was back in 94. Uh, and just trying to help folks make that leap and using registered apprenticeship, which we use for skilled trades all the time, um, to, get into, to get into tech careers. Um, so it's, it's quite rewarding. Um, it is a startup as well, which is pretty cool. Our headquarters is in Seattle. Um, and so I really get engaged in, in, you know, helping us move from chaos order and figuring things out. And I've been there, uh, one of the first people that's still there. And so, you know, it's, it's very cool to help the new markets come on board. And it's really the coolest to hand out uh, the graduation diplomas to people who've made it through the entire 16 month program. So again, it makes me feel old when I think about some of the fun equipment I've worked on and some of the startups I've seen, you know, that are, that are off growing and big and, uh, but it's cool. You know, it, it really, really feels good. Uh, it really feels good, you know, to have interacted or even helped a number of people. So I, I'm very happy where we're at today. Yeah, no. Well, and I mean, I think you're one of the the few that's seen the perspective, right? I mean, you know, you're still, you know, what I would call a young guy, um, but you've seen the the scene, you know, change in Columbus. You've seen it um, globally, you know, and the evolution of entrepreneurship. And and I think one of the hardest things, you know, you mentioned Kaufman, you know, Foundation um, and the statistics. What I th I think a lot of people think entrepreneurship is more prevalent now than it's ever been. And quite frankly, it's actually the opposite that we're on a 30 year slide of entrepreneurship. If you look at it from number of new businesses created, right? 
Um, but I think you've got the highlight reel and the, um, you know, social media and everything else out there that like probably showcases the, the top percentage that people see and are attracted to. Um, and so, I mean, from your perspective, you know, seeing Tech Columbus evolve into Rev1, um, seeing the entrepreneurial education systems get stood up at universities and taking a more deliberate approach to entrepreneurship, um, what's what's kind of your your scope? Where we've been and where where is it kind of headed? Yeah, I so um, I was fortunate enough to be part of the groups that became Tech Columbus. So way back then, we had some great grassroots uh, kind of organizations here in town, and uh, those came together to be Tech Columbus. So um, I was able to see and be part of those. You know those organizations. Uh, we used to call it Alphabet Soup because we had the, the TLC and the BTC and uh, one other one that I can't even think of right now. Um, and we had sent some people down to Austin at that time to kind of see what they were doing. Just like they're they're really doing what we want to do. And so we had sent. I didn't go, but some other folks that I know went down there to Austin and kind of gave us some insight on on how to move forward. Um, and part of that was funding. So part of that that helped us get moving in the state was a large investment from here in, in uh, you know, just available cash to germinate some ideas um, with, with no risk. And that, I, that was, you know, that was really the thing that kicked it off. I will say that, um, you know, in that time when we had the money and we were going and, and there was a lot of, uh, press about West Coast type, uh, the, the businesses, you know, the, the big stories. Um, it, it really did drive a lot of people to want to start something. It drove a lot of people, you know, to us with, with, that, uh, with that pot of cash we had. Um, a lot of it was bad, um, but uh, a lot of really good relationships were, were created. And I see people now that are on their, you know, like me, their third or their fourth one, you know, and they were back then trying, had some crazy idea. And, and we just had to be, I used to be called the dream crusher because I would have to be like, that's a bad idea, man. Sorry. You know, but you should talk to this guy and maybe you guys could do something cool. And to see that a lot of people, you know, kind of moving that. And then people would always say, well, if I was, if I was in Silicon Valley, they'd give me money. And I would say, <laughs> Go to Silicon Valley, man, because <laughs> this right. is not Silicon Valley. And we have a little bit different risk profile uh, and a little bit uh, smaller fund here. But it, it really did generate um, a lot of interest. And I read that stat, too, about about us, you know, on, on, a, on a slide for startups. And I really did kind of, you know, that really did kind of give me pause because, you know, Kaufman also says that, that the, the number of entrepreneurship programs is just continues to go up right? and the number of funds continues to go up and the number of programs like that you're involved that are trying to, you know, uh, get uh, startups and technology in and out of uh, military and DOD type and government type institutions. I hear about them all the time. Right. And um, you know, maybe, maybe we're just, maybe we're not on, on a slide, maybe we're just really in a kind of a new normal of, of whatever that, whatever that giant number is that we feel like we're sliding off of. Maybe that was some weird anomaly peak as opposed to this being an anomaly of, of people dropping because I, mean, I, I, I've spoken at every entrepreneurship related university related organization in the United States. <laughs> and there's a, quite a few of them and they're quite big and there are a lot of people there trying to teach entrepreneurship and help students and such. So I, I am optimistic about, um, you know, all the opportunities there are out there for people that want to get started. I still think that there's plenty of room, plenty of room for people to start and, and, and get going. So yeah, I wouldn't worry if I were out there thinking about, it, I, you know, I would do it. Yeah, no, completely. Well, and I guess, you know, I mean, kind of going along with that i mean there's the there's always a separation 
or the thought of separation, I guess, of what entrepreneurship is, right? So, you know, some people look at it as like, oh, you know, that's that startup world. And, you know, you have to be this high growth tech company to be, you know, entrepreneurial. Um, but a lot of it, you know, is the small business, uh, the lifestyle or Main Street businesses. Um, but then you've got a whole nother side that's, you know, just mindset, right? So, I mean, you can be entrepreneurial inside an organization um, and still innovate, still, you know, do what we would define entrepreneurship as, um, but just being in that frame of mindset. And so I guess, you know, what's your, you know, definition or what do you look at as, you know, um, what's entrepreneurial uh, thought or entrepreneurship in general? Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. I think that we, we in this in this world of that we're in of startups, um, at least I know I am, and I'm guessing you are too. We kind of gravitate to the, the the information and the relationships in a tech type entrepreneurial landscape, right? But there's so many other startups out there that you could do. You could start a popcorn business, for example. That's an <laughs> entrepreneur, right? You could start a food truck. You know, that those kind of things. And, you know, and to be quite honest, I, I think that I think there's just more. I don't say value, but there's more. I'm more interested in that side these days, maybe than I am the high tech, high growth type startups that, that I have to be involved with for the past bunches of years. Um, I'm more enamored now with uh, with the local startups and the the small businesses and, you know, yeah, we always debate their uh, franchise is a, is an entrepreneurial endeavor or not. I think it is. I think the way I always related it to my students in class was, um, you know, you are an entrepreneur. If, if what you're doing provides, you know, money and support and food for your family and other families. Uh, and if you're doing that, then, you know, you are, you know, you are an entrepreneur. So I, I, I don't spend as much time, you know, looking at data from those kind of smaller type businesses, but they're, they're very critical to the economy. And I feel like that's. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, and, um, I mean, you're what Apprenti is doing, you know, and, and introducing, um, you know, I guess you could say, you know, mainly underrepresented communities or uh, disadvantaged communities to, you know, technology um, training skills. Um, you've seen a whole plethora of people that are coming from a background of, um, you know, no tech or low tech, um, but making a, a shift and an adjustment and, and choosing to, um, you know, change, which I think a lot of people will go throughout, you know, their career, whether it's looking at opening a small business, whether it's a career shift, whether it's a technology, you know, upgrade, you know, to go to a, um, a new role or something. Um, what, what's the advice as, as people, you know, have these thoughts and then how do you, how do you act on those? How do you execute and actually make that a reality? Cause I think a lot of people get stuck in the, the, oh man, wouldn't it be nice land, right? So how, I mean, you stepping out, creating businesses multiple times, how do, how do people move? that rock in front of them. Yeah, we used to do, I used to do a, uh, a session uh, when I was at Columbus, we, we'd have a brown bag session. And I, I did one quite often called Wind And it was, it was really meant to talk to, um, and I, I did it uh, a while back for Owu as well. And it really was meant to, to, to talk about that. Like when, when is it a good time to jump into an entrepreneurial venture? Um, you know, whatever type that might be. And, you know, uh, there's no perfect time, right? <laughs> Even if you have all these little blocks lined up and I'm like, yeah, that's great. Do all these things. It's still hard. It's still very difficult. You still work in long hours. You're still at risk. Um, but I think if you, if you're passionate and driven, about something, then those hurdles are not quite as quite as uh, big. But I do recommend to people, clearly, um, to have money in the bank, 
so that you can survive, you know, without, you know, you may go without a paycheck like I did for a couple of years at one startup. Uh, so have some money in the bank or have some way to support you can't, you know, hope is not a strategy <laughs> as they say, and, you know, eventually, yeah, sure. But have some money in the bank, have a support system. You know, I know you do. And I know I have had over the years, uh, my wife is, my wife is the steady one. So having that support uh, back there, um, having thick skin is the other thing I tell people. If you don't, you, then, you know, you better get it or you better find somebody to stick in front of you, some kind of shield, um, because it's hard. It's hard to see here. No, it's hard to it's hard to really 100 percent believe in what you've got. And then people go, eh, it's OK. You know, um, that's hard. So have a thick skin and then have some some form of sales skills. You know, that's I think is really pretty important. Um, and if you don't, then you should get some, you know, or get somebody as a partner to help you with that. Because again, everything's driven off of revenue. Um, and so those are kind of the four things I talk to people about when I'm, when I'm talking to them about whether they should jump. I, I think that again, we, we, I typically live in the land of technology startups where, you know, a guy like me who's technology savvy, but I can't code, um, you know, if I was going to build an app or something, I would want, I would, I would have to figure that out. I would have to find somebody that has the skills to do this stuff. I, I am hopeful that that some of the folks, and I know at least one of our apprentices has done this. They, they, they learned the coding skills through our apprenticeship program. And then, you know, they went out and started doing some things on the side and started doing some little startup things to try to, you know, dip their toe into that pool and just kind of learn how that, how that goes, as opposed to working at a giant multinational bank at all you know all day long and so you know I, I i would say that you know hopefully people will continue to do this because there's no end to the to good ideas you know right so well uh, no that's that's a good point and um yeah i mean i think a lot of times uh you know they say entrepreneurship can be a lonely journey and you know pairing those those different mindsets or those different you know skill sets together right so if you're the the builder um or the caretaker um you're gonna need a promoter right you're gonna you're gonna need somebody out there that you know can represent that and, and tell the story you know to gain the revenue because you know you can have too much building you can have too much engineering but you can never really have enough revenue right um yeah. so it's it's matching you know but you got to be you know like-minded with people uh, as far as, you know, whether morals, values, oftentimes partnerships, they say, uh, um, I remember growing up, my mom always told me, pick your business partner, you know, more uh, with more scrutiny than your your marriage partner, you know, because it's easier to get a divorce than it is to, to get out of a business. So that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been burned by that uh, a couple of times, uh, you know, unfortunately I didn't heed the advice, but, um, but yeah, I mean, but you don't, with that being said, I mean, you can find, the, the right people to build with. And, and a lot of times we, we do see, you know, I mean, Bill Gates, you know, Paul Allen's his left-hand guy, you know, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, you know, I mean, I know those are the, the go-to examples that everybody uses, but it kind of does take that, that balance, right? Because you can live in the, the sky and, you know, build, but at the same time, you got to face reality and pay the bills and, and cover operations at some point too. Um, so yeah, I guess what I think, like in the wind, what's been your experience of seeing people do it? Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, in in some of my experiences, I I was a really good number two. You know, I've I've said that uh, before that, um, you know, my partner in a couple of these things was the, you know, was the guy making things up, you know, and very salesy and. Uh, good relationship guy and could see, you know, he could see 12 months out. Um, and I could see six months out and how to get there. And, you know, uh, that created some good, that created some good synergy, I think, because there was always a push and a pull of, you know, cause I'm, I'm kind of a military guy. I'm a detail guy uh, and um, operational guy. And so, I want to see how things are going to happen. I'm cool with you showing me the, the, the vision and that's in a year from now, but I want to know that we can do that. Like, 
it's a little bit, it, it's not necessarily optimism, pessimism, it doesn't quite like that, but it is optimism in reality. It's really, <laughs> really what I, I usually uh, equate it to. But I, I, in those cases, I, and I think that's, you know, with the examples you've given, it was the same way, right? You had one guy that was like, like Jobs, way out there, like, whoa, and Wozniak's going, okay, no, I can't build it that fast, dude. I can build this, but I can't right. build it that fast. And I can't build that thing. So stop saying that, you know, but this is cool, but that thing eventually, you know, and so I, I like seeing those, I like seeing those pairs. It's hard to be a single person. Like it's hard to be the number one without a number two. I really believe that. Yeah. And I think that was a challenge in uh, certainly in, in my last endeavor, I never really had a number two. I had, you know, um, investors are outsourced, uh, technology firm, uh, all good people, but they had their own interests and it was, and those interests included us, but included a bunch of other things. And so when we got time to, to do that and work as a team, I thought it was good, but then they would disappear. And, uh, you know, that created some challenges, you know, uh, in our growth trajectory, but I, I, am a fan of partnerships who, 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 who's working with you. Do you have that uh, yin and yang kind of thing? You think? Yeah, yeah, we yeah we've assembled. I mean, we did a lot. Um, you know, I, I I ran the solo uh, for a while, and then um, we've got a, a a team of four, you know, internally here, and then a couple people that are stationed uh, remote um, that we've collaborated with, and then we've been able to build with uh, some partners. Like, so our proposal team, you know, is is outsourced, but I consider them an extension of us. Um, you know, we're about to bring on a legal team that'll be kind of the same way. So, um, and, and have those collaborations and, um, it's been, it's been fun. It's been fun to build. So it's a, it's a unique thing. So, um, we've done it non-dilutively so far and now it's kind of a challenge to show people that it can be done. You know, you don't have to go out and raise the 20 million to, you know, have a, have a burn runway. You can actually scale and, you know, we've been cash flow positive from day one and, um, so it's, it's been nice that's that way. Deal, yeah. That's yeah. Deal. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the point we're at. It's like, man, if I threw, you know, gasoline on this fire, we could blow up overnight. Um, and because at the end of the day, you know, ideas don't build companies, people do. So it's assembling the right business models and the, the, the people that can execute on that vision. And then, like you said, thick skin and be willing to pivot and, you know, watch trends and watch where the market is and make sure that you're, you know, paying attention to something that somebody wants. Right. So um, you can you can make it very well when you're hitting pain points that are relative to your audience. So, yeah, I talk about that a lot even now and what I'm doing. And, and I, this was kind of a realization I had also with Venture Highway. And that is, and we, we, I would teach you this in my entrepreneurship classes. You may have the same kind of relative thing, but I would talk about, you know, do you have, do you have a, a vitamin, an aspirin, or do you have morphine? And, you know, when you look at the pain points from another, from, from who you're trying to talk to, what are you offering them? You know, uh, aspirin, oftentimes they're just going to be like, or even a vitamin. Okay. That makes me stronger. Yeah. I should go to the gym more. You know, that's great, but you know what, it, it, but it's not hurting me to not do that. Um, you know, and an aspirin, okay, you're making me 3% better, 5% better, but is it worth the hassle to, to, to go through it, to get what you have? Um, those are very, you know, tough situations to be in. You get a lot of people that go, that's a great idea. That's an awesome idea, but to get them to move over to that writing a check or buying, you know, you need something a little closer to morphine. You need to be solving a pain that's so bad that they're like, oh, I got to solve that. You solve it. That's awesome. Um, and I, too often, you know, we're caught in those situations where we're doing, you know, aspirins <laughs> or even yeah. vitamins. So ah, uh, I, I like that analogy. Yeah, that's a good point. And sometimes it's a tough conversation because even me, like at Venture Highway, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm getting every entrepreneurship professor I talk to, not a single one says this is a bad, but the percentage of them that signed to use it was low because it meant that they had to agree that their way they were doing it wasn't as good as the way I was doing it or 
that I was proposing that they do it. And, and it never, you know, we just never got to that point where it was such a pain that we were solving uh, that it would, you know, that it would grow and scale dramatically. Again, we were, we were just trying to flick, you know, higher education uh, textbook producers like Pearson and McGraw Hill, you know, to at least take notice of us and, and then bring us in so we can build a bigger technology and use their uh, sales processes. But often right. I see that a lot and I have to, you know, I have to say, you're just not solving a big enough pain for people to spend, make the change, take the time, blah, blah, right. blah. You, what you got's great, man. What you got's great. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, I mean, I but, a challenge. human nature, you know, is path of least resistance and, you know, it's, it's got to be enough to, you know, write home about, right? So it's like, hey, this is so dramatically different or at least statistically relevant enough for me to make a change or adjust status quo. And, and often yeah. times it, you know, I think that's why some businesses obviously fail. Some, there's many reasons, you know, that, that people fail. And that's what we try to help supplement is the, uh, the business know-how, the, the expertise um, and fill the holes. Cause I have yet to meet an entrepreneur that is good at everything. Uh, I just, uh, I don't, I don't believe that it exists. <laughs> we all have our, our own personal faults or our own strengths, weaknesses. And, you know, it's so. Yeah, I agree with you. That's why I say you know, I'd like to see those, you know, those yin yang kind of partnerships. Sure. So, well, and I'm, I'm curious from a, a global perspective, you know, being over in Saudi Arabia, seeing um, a, a cultural shift in it. And, and then also, I mean, I remember you put it on Facebook. I think you were there the day that women got the, the right to drive in Saudi Arabia, which a lot of people probably were like, wait, what? Yeah. So over in Saudi Arabia, you know, woman women could not drive, you know, a car. And now we're talking it was about starting that, businesses. Man. Women, yeah, it was way worse than that. It was there the first time that women got to go to a soccer match. Uh, the first time they were able to go to a, a party slash concert on the beach. Um, it was fairly a dramatic shift. Um, and I mean, entrepreneurship is, is the concept of it is very big in Saudi Arabia and in the Middle East. There's tons of little, you know, little shops and little stores and tons of them. Like I think per capita, probably more than we have, just because there's so many little, little tiny shops. Um, but we're excluded from that from that portion. Um, and you know, it, we we did these classes. We took a we took a we took a semester class and smashed it into ten days. So it was all day, every day for 10 days with some, with some uh, like we took one day off, I think in the middle, maybe one or two. We taught the classes in between semesters. So a student could do the semester and then just stay there and take our 10 day class, which might overlap a day or two into the next one. Uh, and we taught like spring break. So instead of going with your family to a fun spring break, you just stay at school and we would teach you all the way through and it might overlap a couple of days. Uh, to after the break. So we had these students 10 days straight all day long. And, um, you know, it took, it took at least a day or two for them to start to realize this is not like what I'm used to. <laughs> this is not the kind of instruction I'm used to. Uh, as you can imagine, teaching a class like that with English as a second language in that kind of environment, uh, it had to be a uh, incredibly experiential and hands-on and getting people up and moving around. You could not just lecture, lecture, lecture. And uh, so we had to, we had to make the class uh, very, very hands-on and interactive. And uh, I think we did a great job of that, but to see them like at the end, man, uh, just to see some of the ideas, you know, we had toward the end after the, after the decree came out that they would be, that women would be allowed to drive, we had businesses that, that they, they launched these, you know, they launched business ideas. They didn't technically launch the business, of course, in 10 days, but launched these business ideas that were, uh, you know, that were car related. They were, they were very female focused. They, they felt empowered to do these things that, you know, day one when they came there, they would have never 
never thought about this, but they had, you know, me and my, my co-instructor um, pushing them, pushing them out of that comfort zone and saying, it's okay. There's a net, there's a net. You're not getting in trouble. You, you, you should try this. It's not, you know, no one's going to say anything, man. And we had these phenomenal um, sessions at the end that I really all, all, always dreamed of doing when I was teaching entrepreneurship. And they would, uh, they would have all their tables, kind of like a trade show. And they would have all their tables and then they'd have that business there. And everybody that came in, we gave them fake money, had money with the president's picture on it of the, of, the, of the university. And we'd give people these big dollar bills or big uh, reals and then they had that money to invest so they would go around and they would get the pitches from all of the all of the groups and then they would um and then they would invest that money in the one that they thought was the best and then we count them up at the end and that team won real money we gave them real money uh, to go have fun with or do what they wanted to do with it so uh, it was, there were some cool ideas, really cool ideas, really fun ideas. Um, and they spared no expense in those booths, man. In 10 days, I can't even tell you how incredibly cool some of those ideas were and those business, you know, the way they showed them at the table. It was awesome. And it continues to, you know, I think continuing over there, I mean, I don't know how many people, you know, they were all young women. Uh, I, I think, again, just getting them to, realize they could do it was the big thing yeah yeah Sorry. well no i mean it looked like i zoomed out there i don't know if you still had me or not but uh i'm back there it looks like yeah no we got you so but yeah no i mean that's a that's quite a cool thing to witness and and see and that i mean incredible to do it in 10 days i mean even here in you know the entrepreneurship class that i teach uh we're basically similar like doing an accelerator right so got a little bit of front end load, you know, entrepreneurial education and, um, you know, idea, uh, creation and all that. And then it's find an idea, run with it. And you've got 10 weeks to build it. And you end with your, your, your final presentation last year, we had to do it all virtually. Um, we'll see what happens this year. Uh, but, uh, if, if we don't, um, I've done those trade shows where we've had, the monopoly money, you know, to do it. So that's the exact same type of thing that we want to do is have the, have a trade show, you know, uh, elevator pitch type winner. And then you have the the mm -hmm. full out presentation, um, you know, with the pitch deck and everything to, to do it, but to do it in 10 days, that's intense. That's, that's, that's cool. It was intense. It was intense. And it was, you know, it's a culture, a very unique culture. And, uh, you know, I was not allowed to walk around the myself. I had to be escorted to the back room. Uh, when we would take the students out, we took them on a field trip. We took them out to a place in the city and let them walk around and, and ideate. And the looks that we got, you know, these two American guys with 60 women, you know, young women in their uh, abayas, you know, the looks we got from the older people was just, it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> You know, and then even, you know, like when we'd have that showcase, right, there would be a lot of older people there that were, this was really new to them. Um, but they were, in, and they were parents of a student. And so they were, you, they were very, very reserved, you know, very reserved. But after they went around and, and saw what was going on and saw the effort that their daughter had done this thing, man, they were, they would loosen up and they would, they would come, most of them couldn't speak English, but, you know, they, you know, they would come and thank us and, you know, just take pictures. And <laughs> you know, it was just, uh, it was very cool. That's for sure. I would go back in a heartbeat and do it again. But Yeah. So, would, um, I mean, just speaking, you know, I guess as in, I, I always see entrepreneurship as like the one like equalizer, like where you can take, you can be any race, gender, religion, whatever and participate um i you know i think there's there's a lot of that um you know shifting there's a lot of focus to include uh underrepresented communities that haven't been you know exposed before but i mean rising tide raises all the ships and when everybody participates you know everybody wins um so the the companies that you know don't include everybody i think are changing 
um, to where they they recognize that they have to, right? Because um, you're missing, you know, a segment of the market if that voice isn't in the boardroom and um, if that, you know, um, uh, you know, voice isn't being heard, you know, by your product development team, your marketing team, whatever. Um, but do you see us, you know, do you see entrepreneurship increasing with this next generation? And um, I mean, COVID is going to throw a whole new thought leadership into what does it mean to have a job? And, uh, you know, are we virtual, you know, hybrid? <laughs> Who knows? But what do you, you kind of see, you know, with your experience with that lens? Yeah, you know, I will have to say that I've, you know, because I've been working this uh, this nonprofit startup for the last couple of years, I've kind of backed out of uh, the startup ecosystem here. Um, but I do hear things on NPR and some other places. And I, I think that at least I'm hopeful, man. Hopeful that it'll keep going. We're still going. There are inclusive funds that are coming out uh, that are focusing specifically on on funding underrepresented groups. Um, I, I think that, um, like you said, people are going to start to realize that your job is not made secure. It's kind of weird instances. So if you had a thought of doing something, now's the time to do it, you know, or, or to start moving in that direction and getting those things in place like we talked about earlier uh, because – you still got to be smart about it, right? But I hope so. I mean, know you? I mean, I'm hopeful that we start yeah. to keep seeing cool stuff. And I mean, as someone, you know, again, as someone who was in this startup ecosystem back in the early to mid '90s, uh, to see where we're at now with um, with unicorn and stuff, man, and you know, and that's the thing that we that we all dreamed about back then, right? You need you need an, you need some investment to 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 try a bunch of stuff. Some things will keep moving, be more successful. Then you have a couple bang big exits. Then those people can can fund and support and mentor, uh, and then bang you hit a couple more of them. And so, uh, I think I was at Tech Columbus uh, when we had a few banks, you know, and and those guys started doing a little bit of funding and mentoring. Uh, and then they switched it to Rev One, put some more investment, changed the focus a little bit, um, and then bang, bang, bang! You've got a couple more unicorns that pop. And now, you're like you read about, it, you're like, oh, we got another one. Okay, great. Yeah. It's interesting. And uh, you know, most of the company I work for is in Seattle, so we have wonderful conversations about how great it is here, and why why folks out there should come here. And, and do startups and be in tech companies. And, you know, I have a good, strong leg to stand on in those conversations, right? Because I'm yeah. not just making it up, man. We're, 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 you know, this community, this area is winning awards and in the top yep. five and top 10 of great lists, not the bad lists, <laughs> good <Right>. lists. <laughs> right. <laughs> make people want to come here and want to bring their business here or want to start their business here uh, or just bring their family here and be in a tech business, which oftentimes, you know, in my experience at Tech Columbus and such, you know, it, I, I always try to speak to those folks. That's why I did the window jump, because I always try to speak to those folks like, OK, you're working in a cube at Cardinal or you're working in a cube at Chase and you you know that's not what you want to do and you just don't feel right and you got these ideas and you're always writing things down i want to speak to that guy or that woman right and go you could do this there's some things to make you smarter to increase your chance of success to lower your risk do these things get yourself prepared keep pounding it away at chase doing what you got to do put money in the bank get your spouse or your significant other or your parents to get behind you um and then get it all lined up so that you can jump out of those cubes into something that you really want to do. And uh, those people still exist and they are coming here from the coasts, I do believe, and getting yeah. the plentiful jobs. There's freaking plentiful jobs in tech here in, in this region. Um, and then hopefully they're, they're sitting there germinating ideas and preparing to, to grow that idea. Hopefully. Yeah, it's no, I, very exciting. Would you say? 
Oh, completely. Well, and I, I think we're we're poised in Columbus. Um, you know, we saw Root exit last year, largest exit, you know, for a startup in Ohio history. Uh, now Olive, you know, has surpassed the, you know, the set new records for know. You know, the amount of money that they've raised and, and, and valuation. Right. And I think we're going to, as you, you know, it's, it's the trees growing, right. And dropping the acorns and then the branches, you know, separating off and starting new trees. Um, whether it's, you know, we'll see a lot of people that cash out in those early, uh, employees become angel investors, become VC firms, become, the COOs or executive suites at the next big startups. Um, and so it, it's it's a very exciting time, you know, to be part of. And I think the one of the, you know, one of those catalysts in the water at Columbus, if you will, is there's still this Midwest tone and Midwest feel that you can reach out to that person. And, you know, maybe not all of them are accessible, but most of them are willing to help and and teach and and guide you know i mean you've been through it you know several times with stuff and people can reach you and you know get a hold of you and get advice and then figure out where it goes from there but um whereas you you go to the haughty toddy cities you know the coasts and the austins uh you know to some degree and it's like oh well this is you're not on our level like you know you're not a fellow CEO or something, you know, this is a closed door community um, where I think that's where Columbus is a little bit more unique and more open door, um, at least from my experience, from what I've seen. So. hundred percent. I mean, we've said that for years, you know, most people will have a coffee with you. <laughs> you know, most people will take a coffee and listen to you. I will, I'll provide advice. And I can't grab a shovel and start digging with you, but I'll take a coffee with most people if I have time, if I'm not in the middle of all the million things I'm doing right now, but uh, I'll take a coffee or a call or an email. Um, I'm not, like I say, I'm not, I don't have free time to grab a shovel and join in, but I, uh, I, I will give unvarnished, honest opinion to anybody. You can take it, you can leave it. And what I, again, what we tell entrepreneurs is do get my opinion and then get Steve's opinion and then go get Tim's opinion and then get, you know, her opinion and her opinion and his opinion, take all of them. And then you make the decision just because I've been around and done it. And you have, doesn't mean we know the right answer. It knows what we would do or what we have done, but that's the beauty. It's not just getting one person to give you the advice. It's getting five people to give you, to give you advice. And then you being smart enough to synthesize that and go, okay, all right, well, that's, this is what I'm going to do. And, and that's, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was, I was helped in that decision by talking to these people. That's what real mentorship is about. And we often have that. I think that's a challenge in, in, you know, I've been involved in accelerators and working with, you know, new startups for a long time. And often that, you know, they'll, they'll let's talk to one person who has been successful and they'll ask that person a question and the person will tell them what to do and they'll just go do it and it won't ma- it won't make it it won't work and they'll be like why well, you told me I to do it like that well just not that's not the, the role of the mentor the role of the mentor isn't to tell you what to do it's to tell you what they think and then you decide what you want to do out of that um, and so you know if anybody's out there listening <laughs> and you're thinking about just just get a bunch of advice and then make the decision on your own you've got to You've got to do with it. So, and that's the good thing here in Columbus is it's not that hard. Again, buy me a cup of coffee, buy me a drink. I'll give you my opinion. You can do with it what you want. Right. All right. For sure. So, well, well that's a, that's a good uh, point uh, here to uh, end it. I, I appreciate the time, um, you know, so, but for anybody that does want to connect with Kevin right there, you can email Kevin um, and connect with him, buy him a cup of coffee, get his advice. Uh, so uh, feel free to, to reach out. So um, Kevin, always a pleasure. Uh, um, I guess we'll see you here a little bit later tonight. We've got an open house tonight for fires or for the uh, first Fridays of Delaware. So, uh, anybody that's out there, you know, feel free to come down, um, check out uh, City of Delaware with the uh, first Fridays and uh, um, have a little open house here for one of our tenant companies 
um, Veteran Companion Animal Services, an awesome nonprofit that I know Kevin serves on the board there, um, but doing some really cool things here uh, out of the Entrepreneurial Center. So come check us out tonight live. So Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, again, yes, Veterans Companion Animal Service. I definitely want to put a plug in for, for that. I'm proud to be on the board. I'm new to the board. It is a, a, a growing startup nonprofit that uh, provides uh, typically dogs plus a year's full of services and food insurance uh, to help a, a veteran uh, that needs companionship uh, assume that responsibility in a in a much easier way. So yeah, it's cool. So we're going to have an open house and there's a lot of other cool stuff up in Delaware. So yeah, I appreciate you calling me. Yeah. Hope this is awesome. helpful for somebody. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> we, never, we never know who we reach. So it's, it's awesome. We get a lot of messages from people that, you know, uh, they pull out nuggets, uh, from, from what's said. Um, you know, we talk it all day, but, um, it's, uh, and, and I enjoy hearing it. I mean, learning from others, I mean, is, is awesome. Right. So being able to hear those stories and, um, have those successes and, and failures and, and be able to, again, heed the advice, right. Here's the information. Here's the data. Now you go and put your own twist on it and decide what to do with it. That's what makes it special. So yes, indeed. appreciate it. So, well, everybody have a wonderful rest of their Friday, and uh, we will see you uh, next week uh, for Fireside Friday. Again, right here at the Delaware Entrepreneurial Center at Ohio Wesleyan. Take care, everyone.